Welcome to Shop Talk Live. On this episode, Mike and Barry join me, and we discuss the emerald ash borer ravaging some of our favorite trees, our favorite things to look for in sketchbooks, using a hollow chisel mortiser as a drill press, and what books inspire us to get out into the wood shop. But first, I'm going to keep this one simple. Fine Woodworking Shop Giveaway with Laguna, 1412 bandsaw, an F2 Fusion table saw, a one horsepower dust collector, a Revo 1216 lathe, and a six inch jointer with SheerTech 2. It doesn't get much better than this, people. Head on over to finewoodworking.com slash sweepstakes, enter for your chance to win all five of these incredible tools. Finewoodworking.com slash sweepstakes. Show starts now. Should I do an intro? No. So here. All right. Ben's trying to be all timely. <laughs> yeah, but that there was a there was a listener. There was a listener um, email with good advice that. Yeah. Here's how you have to do. You know, because the cold start is rough. Yeah. This is what you got to do. The cold start has gone over really well last time. Though. <laughs> the 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 bigger pile of crap we wade into on the cold start the more people like it i think uh, <laughs> which so, we're rolling right now so no so this is exactly what we want to see what you want to do is you want to come in we're in the middle of conversation right yeah, yeah and you just come in in the middle of the conversation and you just say okay let's go ahead and get started and then we go yeah it's a rolling start all right let's go ahead okay. and get started all right. Well, I feel I feel bad because I had something in mind, but Ben was trying to be timely with these new intros and like talk about. Yeah. But I'm gonna go today. So like in the past for the listeners, Ben, Lee Valley free shipping ends today. Oh, screw you, man. So you got to jump on it before 11:15. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Awesome. Well, <laughs> Lee Nielsen sale on the bronze um, rabbit block plane ends today really wait Lee Nielsen giving, has sale that's what I was <laughs> they're giving them away for free but it ended today <laughs> <laughs> <You're a jerk. sighs> that was awful that, that was, was a good was slow burn awful. And then boom. <laughs> <laughs> I like that which is your point of the timely comment which is intentionally two weeks out of date <laughs> I like that <laughs> well, I try to find new creative ways to tell Ben Lee Valley oh, free shipping is going really on, does. and so I found a new outlet. Barry, for the podcast. so so this is something Barry and I torment each other with with little things, right? And this is something that right from the get go, I think <laughs> Barry was like, "Hey, nice to meet you. By the way, Lee Valley free shipping," because it's difficult when they have free shipping to not spend yeah forty dollars immediately, mm-hmm. like it just falls out of your pocket. Yeah. And so Barry has taken to harassing me when they're that's, leave that's out. A, that's a kind of word. <laughs> to the point where he has snail mailed <laughs> to my house a printout of the email announcing Lee Valley free shipping. <laughs> <laughs> the key was to get in the mail early so it arrived in time. <laughs> How often do they have free shipping? A lot. It's becoming more regular. Okay. And the the problem is, it's like you only have to hit forty dollars to get the free shipping or something like that. Huh. But for some reason, I can hit one hundred dollars with leave with Lee Valley like that. Yeah. And I actually think my Lee Valley cart right now mm-hmm. is it's a beautiful thing. It is legitimately one hundred dollars and zero cents. What's the best like product or products that are specifically you're getting from Lee Valley? Um, like on a regular basis. And I'm talking like a Veritas hand plane or something like that. Like what do you? I don't buying? think there's anything consistent. If if wait, should we look at my Lee Valley? If I hide glue, I'd get from them when the free shipping's going on, so I don't have to drive an hour up to Woodcraft. Oh, okay. Um, uh, okay, so it isn't. Like, for instance, I love the Lee Valley Brad Point bits. I will only yeah. buy Lee Valley Brad Point bits. Yeah. But it's not going to be like I'm only going to buy their right. type on glue. Right. Yeah, there's nothing specific to that, at least not for me. Okay. But it's just the free shipping's here. I want to upgrade my block plane. Am I going to do it now? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Okay. Oh, wait. My, my cart is not $100 because somehow... 
a PMP 11 bevel up smoother is in there too right now. I don't know. So that's, that's definitely, I definitely do not, I'm not hitting go on this one. Um, diamond paste. Uh, what else is there? There's, so I love, they have their all lit modular storage cases. It's like, <laughs> what's the, this episode sponsored by <laughs> Levi. <laughs> I wish. Um, scrapers. Uh, there's a couple of combo plane blades in there. <laughs> the usual. Uh, I have issues. But this is, yeah. So this is, that's, I That'd be don't. Cool. We should do personality studies based on anybody's, like, what they have in any cart in any website they shop at. I don't think it's necessarily what's in the cart. It's in the, like, you know how Amazon has the save for later section? Yeah. That mine oh. is, like, years old. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not necessarily the things that you actually bought. It's the things you were going to buy and yes. then backed out that are really mm, telling about the, you. The, yeah, that can be kind of scary. It's like, really? I was thinking that. <laughs> okay. So was that the opening you wanted? Oh, yeah, that was all I wanted. Okay. I told you, you'd regret it. I told you. <laughs> ben got excited. He's like, oh, I like this. And, you know, you're going to regret it. Okay. Barry goes, can I start the show today? <laughs> wow. wow. Somebody's taking initiative. I'm going to cross that's, that off the That's notes. a bold move. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Should we answer some questions? Sure. Yeah. All right. First question is from William. I live in Ohio where the emerald ash borer is ravaging every ash tree around. With all these ash trees coming down and the infestation of the ash borer, are we looking at a future shortage of ash trees? Should we, as woodworkers, stock up on quality ash boards while we can get them and while they're fairly inexpensive? This is the typical woodworker mentality. Actually, it's a lot of people's mentality in regard to a lot of things. It's like, oh my gosh, it's like global warming. It's like killing the world. But wait, does that mean there's going to be less frozen stuff? <laughs> and we could like... Now it opens up shipping lanes. Wait. Oh, wait. Oh, that's a good thing. You know, it's like we go right from, oh, no, it's like a, a classic wow. American wood species is being devastated. Does that mean I can get it for cheap? Right. <laughs> so. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Well, Don't is, we have this conversation at we least do. once a week? I was going to say, William, this is, this is not a knock on you because this is exactly how all of us think. In fact, I, I am always looking at the, at the ash piles at the lumber yard thinking, I gotta be buying more of that, and it's wicked cheap right now. Like, yeah, wicked. It's like the price of pine. That's what I thought. Yeah. So, well, yeah. If you're if you're a smart man, and you got the funds and the place to store it, um, yeah. I mean, ash is. I don't think it's ever going to be like oh, thirty dollars a board foot. Well, I don't well, know, yeah, maybe. it will because chestnut is. So. Yeah, you know. Can I tell you something? I don't really like chestnut. Oh. Wait, so what about it? What? What about chestnut do you not dig? It's kind of ugly. It's kind of the grains all over. So it's like the same reason you dislike, well, you dislike red oak, right? Like flats on red oak? I don't know. I mean, okay, chestnut isn't bad. In fact, John Tetra has a lot of it. He does like, <laughs> John does a lot of amazing things with it. Yes. And it's like cool, but it isn't like. He would also do amazing things with like. Bamboo. Exactly. <laughs> I think it's almost like this. Maybe I just haven't seen like the really primo quality. I guess it kind of looks like, well, it kind of looks like butternut. Yeah. And I can yeah. get really nice butternut. So I don't know. But ash, I mean, yeah, that'd be a bummer. I like ash. One, if it goes away, that would be a bummer. If red oak goes away, eh. Yeah, no, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Can we, like, train the beetle to eat the red oak? <laughs> <laughs> a little piece of good news, though. I read that the cold snap we had. No. It, the, wait, that's fake? That's it's, fake news? It's uh, Sh Shannon Rogers on the last episode of Wood Talk. He debunked it. It didn't go on long enough and didn't oh. affect it. It, it would have, like, at best, it it tripped it up. No, well, that's what I said. It yeah. slowed the ash borer. Well, like. Like we bought an extra week for like, uh, yes. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but they, uh, they yeah. um, in nineteen states they have introduced, and you know, you know that like everybody in Australia is is going like ah, that's not a good idea. They introduced a Chinese, oh no, wasp. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> that eats the ash, the ash borer larvae. So they've, it also they've has combated like the, it. All right, all right. 
Last time I was on, I did a Simpsons reference. Another Simpsons <laughs> reference. <laughs> They yeah, brought in like two people are really psyched you're back on. They, were, <laughs> they brought in like a snake to eat the lizards that had taken over, and then they brought in like big cats to eat the snakes, and they brought in <laughs> bears to eat the yeah. cat. It's like that's the craziest solution. Yeah, yeah, as long as they don't bring in frogs to eat the wasps, <laughs> I think we're good. But and and they don't sting, so no, oh. they have no stingers. They look like they have stingers, but that's their their bits. We'll and say. they eat the borer, or what do yes. they do? Yes. Huh. So they're hoping that that might slow it down more. I don't think. Hmm. hmm. We're screwed. Yeah, I think Connecticut. Last I heard, I think they said within twelve years, every ash tree in Connecticut is dead. Twelve years. My God. Yeah. Every ash tree in my yard is dead. Same with me. I got one. Yeah, I got it. Got to get that sauna up. Get it sticker <laughs> yeah. dry. Rives really nicely. Yes. I got to get one taken down. Man. Big. Me too. Hmm. Um. All right. Question number two. We answered that one thoroughly, right? I'm a little depressed, so I think we did. <laughs> That's how you know you did a good job. Uh-huh. Mike's depressed. <laughs> all right. Question number two is from Paul. I started looking for a better sketchbook and am overwhelmed by the choices. I've heard Mike talk about the books he uses, but I've never heard him mention the brand or model he favors. On Top Talk Live 155, he mentioned 60 60 to 80 pound paper, spiral bound, unruled, six by nine size. Frankly, that limits it to about half a zillion options. And it's very hard to judge quality even touching the book in the local art supply place. So please spill, Mike. Uh, Yeah, I mean, if you have a local art supply place, go look at them, see what you like. Flip the pages. If the texture is good, if the weight is good, sometimes, you know, heavier is good, but if it's too heavy, it's almost like you're writing on postcards and it's like, uh, that's uncomfortable because you feel like each page is a little too precious and there's not enough pages in there, too flimsy. It's like, eh. um, some really good brands that have more of sort of an off-white cream color to the paper. I personally don't like it. I like white, white paper. And it's up to you if you like lines or not. I typically do not like lines because I'm doing more sketching than the writing. So... Again, that's like it. And yeah, I would say there's probably at least a half dozen brands that fulfill that really well. Um, And you like bite to your paper, right? A little tooth. A little tooth, yeah. Yeah. Um, So just go to, yeah, if you got an art supply store or something like that, go and there's a bunch. Just look at them. Pick them up. This looks good. Try it. Do It's not a scientific thing. So so you're you're not going to give them an actual specific answer? Only because I was late to the podcast. <laughs> um, yeah, no. I have seen books similar to this one. Is yeah. this the one that you use? What is this one? I don't know. Okay, this one. Reflections with an X. I don't I know. think I've seen that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's perfectly fine. Oh, that's the other. Oh, nice sketches in here. And this one does have the little perforations, like, perforations to tear the page out. I'm not really ever pulling my pages out. If you like that, that's cool. <laughs> If you're into that kind of This is fine for you, man. One thing. So the one I have, I got dots. It's gridded. And I did that. So I don't love it. So this is a Rhodia. Oh, yeah. Rhodia. What's it? My wife really likes Uh, Rhodia. See, this paper's too thin. So it's got thin And the cover's too slippery. And it's square. I do not like square format. Yeah, I'm learning I do not like the square because as you have it on your knee or something, Uh it's got too much on the wings and it kind of wants to bend. But also the flimsy covers, Mm. there's not enough support. Whereas you have a rigid... And Mike, you have rigid covers, right? Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Actually, the dots, I'm kind of thinking, huh, are the dots cool? So the dots I dig, on the one hand, they're absolutely a crutch. No, that's okay. Are they quarter inch? Yes, I believe so. Huh. But what's nice is I'm like, oh, this scale is working for me with my drawer layout, yeah. you know, or whatever. Yeah. And it's a new book, so flipping's not going to get you anywhere. <laughs> but I mean, it's it's like it's it's uneasy it's letting Mike flip through your sketchbook, isn't it? <laughs> but it is so yeah, the dots are a crutch. But it's nice guidelines that I don't feel like they're prescriptive. It's not grid mm-hmm. work. It's not like college ruled like you're going to write on it. They're just there if you want them. But they're super light blue. 
super light gray, so you can ignore them easily and they yeah. don't distract you. Actually, um, this may trump everything because I was just up at Peter Galbert's yesterday um, <laughs> and he was showing me a computer program that you were talking about, Ben. What's a drawing program where you can like do Everybody little... Google Procreate. Procreate. I thought it was Procreate. Then I thought, wait, Procreate? That's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> it is Procreate. But yep. that's the name. Um, so I was using Peter Galbert's. He has the iPad Pro with the stylus, which I think Ben has, but Ben has never even let me use his. Peter let me use his. Um, Peter Listen, also. You throw away a pencil if somebody touches it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, Peter also has this like film, textured film that goes on the surface to give it just I a little bit that. more bite. Yeah. And also the new styluses, which are. What are they, like 100 bucks or something? Yeah. But they're actually pointy as opposed to the old rubber nib thing, which I used to use on my iPad, and it was horrible. And so I think I, I love the new stylus. I love the fact that you can get a little tooth on it, um, which is a problem I've had using. And I've used um, iPad drawing programs in the past. I think, what is it, Paper 53 or something? Yeah. It was one I used quite a bit, and I just sort of got away from it. But... I'm really, and then this Procreate program where you can draw, you keep a record of it, and basically just kind of create a video so you can actually go back to anywhere you want. There's yeah. layers. It looks really intuitive. You can, it's I kind, guess. It's, it's kind of Photoshop-y with the layers. Yeah. Um, I really like it. I use it for different things. I like taking a picture of something in a museum. Yeah. And drawing on top of it. That's. In Procreate. I love that. That is something that was kind of game changer for me because I'm not, I'm not good at like creating stuff out of thin air. So it's like we were at, at the Wadsworth and saw there was a um, arts and crafts uh, hutch that it totally not my style, but the dimensions of it were really interesting to me. Yeah. So I took a picture of it um, and then I'm able to draw all over it. And change the width of the styles, change the width of this, add drawers here, add that. And that's been really big for me. Cool. It's drawing on top of things with Procreate. Yeah, that was really exciting. And I think the thing for me is, and what I saw, Peter, he showed me some past things he's done. He's a Windsor chairmaker, probably like, you know, one of the top, top Windsor chairmakers right now. And he was working on this new design. It was a settee. So he just kind of had this plywood mock-up all just clamped together that he could take a picture of and it just defined the length of the seat, the height of the legs and the height of these, of the little back rest verticals. Mm -hmm. And so it was this really rough crude skeleton, but it did represent the scale that he wanted to do. So he took a picture of that and went into Procreate and did this entire detailed drawing of Windsor Satie based on this skeleton yeah. of proportions and dimensions. That was really cool. And what, What's exciting about this and what I really, really like sketch pads for is that you know, a lot of times people say, oh, SketchUp or CAD, um, they can be really helpful. But I think it's a misnomer to say that you actually design in CAD or SketchUp. You're, you're quantifying a design. You're like rendering a design to exact dimensions. But... Are you really creating? Are you really generating a design? I don't. I I don't know. But like, I mean, for sketch, like I do like the sketch pad, and then I go to scale, and then from there I go to Adobe Illustrator drawing program. But I already know what I'm drawing at that point. I think you're a much stronger designer than me. <laughs> but uh, for me, I will. I will get the basics into SketchUp, and then I can play with, uh, you know, pull this, use a push-pull tool, pull this out so that there's a little bit of, a, of an overhang, add the reveal there, do this, and I can play with it more in SketchUp so you're actually... than I can in my head. Okay, that's or cool. Or I try and draw too detailed. I know you're always screaming, don't do that. Yeah. And you throw things at me when I do I too. It's really... <laughs> Duck. Disconcerting. You're amazingly quick. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I try and draw really detailed and I enjoy it. When I'm on an airplane, that's about the only time that I sketch now. Um, and th with, with that said, I have a separate sketchbook for airplanes now. Because oh. this is, um, I've, what, I probably really lame named sketchbooks, I Rock Book <laughs> uh, by Claire Fontaine. 
But this is it's just a little sketchbook, same size, six by nine ish or whatever, and decent paper, but it just slips into my bag easier than yeah. this one. This one takes up too much room. I found I can't carry it with me every day. This one is always in my bag along with my iPad. So like on an airplane, I might be drawing on top of a picture on the iPad or, you know, drawing doodles in the in the sketchbook. Yeah. Um do you find the lack of spiral frustrating? Like when I open up a book, I don't want more page yeah. than I need. More page than I need. I, I don't deep, like the, yeah, yeah, I, can't, I can't stick my pen in the in the spine. Yeah, where do you put your pen? Yeah. There's literally nowhere else to store it. There's nothing worse than a sketchbook without <laughs> yeah. a and sketching on utensil. <laughs> if yeah. only I had a place to put a pen in here. <laughs> but well, I think we kind of beat that to death without actually answering it. So the, the the answer is procreate. Yeah. I is, do you want to borrow my iPad and and mess with it? Sometime? No, because then I won't have an excuse to buy an iPad Pro. Uh, you don't, you don't need a Pro, and I don't think Peter has. A I pro. Think, Are you sure? I think yeah. three. Is, oh, an iPad three or four or newer. Well, I'm sure it. because this oh, is yeah. not a Pro. What is yeah. that? This is your basic. Run of the mill iPad now, and it's just a stylus. This three hundred and twenty nine dollar iPad gets you Apple Pen capability. Oh, my iPad's more expensive than yours. Well, mine <laughs> uses the Apple Pen. <laughs> I did get a hard drive upgrade, so I, I huh. okay. I'll have to see. Yeah, well, maybe it's just a stylus. That's cool. And then that little no, film. It has to be six sixth generation. Uh, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I went to the Wikipedia page because I wanted five generations for this reason. preceded it. And it didn't help at all because they've now rebranded. Like instead of iPad two, three, four, it's now just iPad. Well, I have iPad Air two, which yeah, is yeah. No, the, yours yours won't use the Apple Pen. I'm sorry, yours Apple. won't use it. <laughs> Mine does. Yours won't. <laughs> okay. I was patient. <laughs> <laughs> so we're good because I'm depressed again. So okay. let's move on. <laughs> All right, let's um oh man, I didn't think about my all time favorite tool. Wow, someone didn't prepare. Mm. All right. I'm going last. All right. It's time for everyone's <laughs> all five all time favorite tool of all time for this week. You want first, Mike, or should I go? Um Oh I know. <laughs> uh well I can um yes, I'll go first in that <clears throat> um I just cut about four inches off the handle of one of my Japanese saws. <laughs> it's a good move. And um, and then I posted on Instagram just because I knew. <laughs> Heads would explode. Yeah. I just, you know, sometimes you got to poke that wasp nets with a <laughs> stick sometimes. I apologize because, yes, that was intentional, putting the photo out there. No, I didn't cut it off just to bother people. Um, I'm, like, packing like mad to get stuff together for a weekend demonstration I'm doing in Alabama. Um, creating tons and tons of things. I'm just trying to get them to fit. I had this one Japanese style um, toolbox that I decided to put all my hand tools in because my regular toolbox is too big. I wasn't going to ship it, and I had my Japanese saw, and it was too long. I thought, ugh, I just, and I'm really at the point. I mean, this is like the third day of a three-day week, and I'm trying to get stuff in. Took my Japanese saw to the chop saw, boom. Put some blue tape around that end to keep that little rattan from, yeah. from peeling up. I was wondering if you glued it before you chopped it. or No, yeah, so okay. no, a little blue tape first and then right. hit it. <laughs> um, and it's it's obviously not, you know, I have other saws. It's okay. And also, it's just a saw I plan on using for Kumiko. So really small, delicate work. And I typically choke up on the saw anyway. Um, so... It, I knew functionally it was like no big deal to do it. And I'm always sort of, if my tool doesn't quite fit my toolbox and I can cut it down anyway, mm -hmm. I'm going to cut it down. My um, Veritas spoke shave, which I love, you know, most of them have sort of pointed ends to the wooden handles. Mine are sort of like stubby. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's like a little quarter inch too long. You know, belt sander, just kind of bring those <laughs> down. So I don't have a problem with that. Some of my chisel handles are shorter than they were. So it was, it was no big deal. So I guess that's why my fit. And then someone said, really, you can just unscrew the blade. It takes like four seconds. <laughs> <laughs> but I saw the spine is still there, right? The, the spine, spine is still there. Too? It is but it shorter. Be as long, yeah. It is like 
okay, honestly, it's probably short enough if I had taken the blade out. <laughs> Did I think to take the blade out? I didn't. Honestly, I didn't. So hats off. I'm not going to admit that. But on the other hand, it's like it's not designed to take the handle. It's not the, designed to take the blade out. It's designed to replace the blade. And this is an old beat up blade. It's got some glue and a couple broken teeth. And so it's like if you take that out and put it back in, it's like it's like putting on dirty socks. You can't do it. I, I, you have to put in a brand new I blade think, if you're going to do that. I think it's half a, our, our audience has grown. So, but you know that I'm not going to put like a dull beat up blade back into a hand. That's just not right. I don't know, but I have the same thing. And I think all of my saws fit in my toolbox, but I don't want to, I want more storage out of them. And they're too long. They take up a lot of space. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, I could just take the blade out. And my brain stops there. It's like, no, you won't. You know, it's, it's just I think the, like, like a one time thing. Like if it's just, I just needed to get it in there for now. But I don't want to be taking the blade out every single time I put the saw that, away. That makes more sense to me. Yeah. So and then plus it's that that is your saw. You know it's your saw. Yeah. You like you can spot your saw from across the room. <laughs> so and truth be told, like I do have a separate box um, toolbox that I made specifically for Kumiko, and it's really really long, and it fits my saws. Really well. I wasn't taking that. So, mm. I don't know. It didn't bother me to cut it off. Mm. Um, but it bothered a lot of other people. <laughs> I, I, let's see, I have uh, my Bad Axe carcass saw that I... cut I, the handle off that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually, I actually shaved the handle a little oh. bit. It just, it wasn't quite fitting my hand perfectly. Yeah. And it was like... I, this is a great saw. It should fit my hand perfectly. I should. I, it's wood. I am mm -hmm. a woodworker. Mm -hmm. How about I just take a rasp to this, and now it's perfect in my hands. Cool. Um, I took a file to the mouth of my Lee Nielsen spoke shave. And <laughs> hey, Barry. Really? <laughs> yeah. It was too tight. Yeah. It was too tight to use any wet wood. And oh, okay. And I just. When we were at Fine Working Hands On, uh, you know, somebody had a Lee Nielsen spoke shave and, and Dave goes, oh, this is too tight. You can't use it. I said, well, you could just take a file to it. And everybody looked at me like, yeah, what is wrong with you? Why would you even <laughs> say that to me? But it's my tool. I want yeah, my sure. tool to work for me. Yeah. And if the only problem with right. my tool is that the mouth is too, too small, yeah. open it up. Yep. Yeah. And one person responded, well, <clears throat> you know, I hold it at the very end because it's more accurate. Blah blah blah. It's like, well, don't cut the handle off your saw. Yeah. That's yeah. okay. Yeah. Another person said, Well, I use it, I grip it up closer, but I use the handle, I rest the handle against my forearm as I'm sawing. It's like, don't cut the handle off your saw. That's okay. Yeah. But um use their own. And and Peter Galbert, who I have tremendous respect for, as everyone should, he kind of burned me unintentionally because I told him I cut the handle off it. And he goes, Well, yeah, you know, a lot of beginners grip it up near the blade anyway, so they wouldn't even miss it. It's like, oh, not only okay. is he a fantastic furniture yeah. maker, he's great at burning money. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Yikes. thank you, Peter. Peter listens to podcasts all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think so. No. All right. My benchtop mortiser is my all-time favorite tool, maybe for the year of all time. This oh, the one you just got? Yeah. So, I work out of a spare bedroom in my apartment. Yeah. Upstairs, I have a couple they're two neighbors they're a couple and they have a kid who i think is about eight months old between eight months and five years old yeah so i try to be dead quiet you know it's like church mouse quiet but i had to chop a bunch of mortises and that's not even a little bit quiet so i'm wondering what am i going to do this am i going to do a mortise at a time and then on facebook marketplace a benchtop mortiser popped up and those things are as quiet as a drill press. It just, yes. It's like a, it's, they're like big cats purring. It's just, drrr, drrr. <laughs> it's a great metaphor. And I was able to bang out all these mortises in a night. And, and the nice part is they're all done by a machine. So when I'm fitting the tenons, I'm not worried about, oh, is it the mortise or is it the tenon? I'm not going back. It's yeah. my tenon that's jacked up. I just mess with the tenon. And it was quiet. It gave me great results. 
it was like $175. Hmm. And it's just, I adore it. it it's awesome. it's funny because uh, we've had the question with you on before, you know, apartment woodworking, what power tool do I buy or, you know, how do I make mortises quieter? And, and, and I think that's just gone right past us every single time. And then you came and you're like, I'm buying a benchtop mortise. I said it the first time I was on the podcast and everyone looked at me like I was a jerk. In fact, Th- no, that's our by. default look towards I know. you. So but- I've, been, I've been here from the start, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Have you? D- yeah. Did you really say that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'm in. I remember that. Sure. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So speaking of mortises, um, like what's, what's your favorite size mortise you like to cut? Oh, probably a quarter inch. Mm. Is it just a single one? Yeah, quarter inch. Quarter. Because even if it's a double, I'm doing quarter. Eight millimeter domino. <laughs> <laughs> that was sort of continuation of a conversation, a really misguided, horrible conversation we had with Anissa last time around about what your favorite dimension is. So this is, it was a, a take on that, but this was really serious because... We were talking about favorite dimensions, and the thing I didn't mention is I really like five sixteenths mortises. Oh, because it's quarter sometimes is like too skinny. Three eighths in like a door frame can be too fat. <laughs> but you're you're hand chopping those too. What? No, five sixteenths mortiser. Yeah. Do you have? Okay. I have never seen you use your mortiser. Huh. Use it all the time. Yeah. Oh. I love my mortiser. You peek in the window more. Often. The <laughs> is that just aesthetically or structurally too? I guess it doesn't. Just, it just sometimes quarters too skinny. Uh-huh. Yeah, like in in big members, it's too skinny, and then three eighths sometimes can be kind of horsey. So this is a continuation of your distaste for three quarters of an inch as a kind stock of. size. Uh, yeah, maybe so. <laughs> but I do like the five sixteenths mortar, so I think it's a it's a good investment. That's because I have so all the members are an inch square, or almost all the members okay. are an inch square, and I just had a quarter inch bit. I'm like, I'll just use that. Mm. Five sixteenths maybe would have made me feel better. Maybe. Double up your quarter inch. Would you worry about deflection? No, space them out, do double tenons. Yeah. I mean the ship has sailed, but yeah, I could have done Normally yeah. like for yeah, so like let's say you're doing uh I will try to if I'm doing like a really like a wide mortise. Mm-hmm. Um like, let's say I need to do a 5 8 inch mortise. Rather than using a half-inch bit or 3 8 inch bit where I'm overlapping, I'll probably use a quarter-inch bit, make parallel rows so there's no deflection on the walls. Okay. And then... They have meat, and then get rid of that little bridge of waste, ideally. Oh, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I've done both, though. And especially, probably, what are you working in? Super soft pine. Yeah, it's, there ain't no deflection. <laughs> <laughs> My all-time favorite tool of all time for this week is my Chris Bexford dovetail marking guide. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, that's too cool. Shut up. Do another one. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that cool. I mean, he sells them. Where? Like On his website. website. There's like this secret little portal on his website. I think it's like it's called... Is it Fort? like the Matrix where like you click the... Or no, yeah, it was yeah. like the net. The movie The Net with Sandra Bullock. Yeah. Remember that where there was like a pixel on a web page and you click that and it like brought it. Yeah. Back in like my early web page making days, there was always like this. So that was a real thing? I thought that was like a Hollywood thing. No, everybody did that I think back in the day. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It was like if you clicked on somebody's nose, it would bring you to whatever. Um, But uh, on Chris Bexford's website, there's a page for woodworkers where he sells stuff. Okay. And he sells his dovetail markers. And it's based off, like, you know, he got the angle off of a piece of furniture he rebuilt years and years ago, and that's what he's always done. And the thing that I really like about it is there's – maybe not so much anymore. I feel like there used to always be debate, like, oh, I cut my dovetails at this angle. I cut my dovetails at this angle. And now I'm like, I cut my dovetails at whatever Chris Bexford says I do. <laughs> yeah, so there. So, like, <laughs> top that. <laughs> what angle is it, do you know? No idea. That's cool. Do you you want to know? You're the guy who likes angles. The, uh, so, okay, so I either want to be entirely in the dark or mm-hmm. I want to know to the tenth of a degree. Okay. Um so the only reason why I kind of want to know is if I was to buy well, a table saw blade. But well, no, I don't need to buy a table saw blade. Just somebody needs to give me my table saw blade back. 
somebody who's not listening, I know that. Um, but if I had a table saw blade ground, but then there's no point in the dovetail say, marker. It, it, yeah. <laughs> so it's just if I'm hand if I'm fully hand cutting, mm-hmm. I'm doing it to that size. To, to whatever that angle is. Okay. If I'm going to start at the table saw, that's what the angle is that day. You do what? Seven and a half or whatever? Eight. <laughs> Degrees. Yeah. Right? I was. L- <laughs> you had done seven and a half. I was doing seven and a half, so I just bought, I had to get a new blade ground, so I just said eight. And then I stuck it in, and it's like it was a little bit off, so it's eight and a half. Oh. It's eight and a half? Yeah. Wow. Because yeah. I thought you were explicitly so, trying to avoid that 0. 0.5. I was. But yeah. Now it's 8.5. <laughs> the 0.5s really, are great. I feel really bad because people say, what what angle? 8.5. <laughs> okay. It's and just, trim I'm your sorry. hand off the saw. Yeah, too. eight's fine. Anywhere years, from. Years from now, an antiques roadshow, somebody's going to be like, well, we can tell this was a Mike Beckford because it's eight and a half. <laughs> it's just slightly <laughs> off the Bexford. <laughs> just <laughs> off the Bexford. <laughs> This, right. this is really cool. Yeah. My daughter is taking an architecture class in college, and they're studying, like, shaker communities. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm talking about Hancock Shaker Village in Massachusetts, which is a great place to visit. And the subject that came up was the fact that some of the drawer sides in the shaker furniture made at Hancock Shaker Village, the, the thickness of the sides are tapered, wider at the bottom, thinner at the top. And she's telling me all about why this is i'm going no no one knows why it's like this is we debate why but she knew why so it's like okay why what did she say they're tapered thinner at the top than the bottom to give you more room i thought "Hmm." okay i've heard that it makes fitting the drawer easier it doesn't Wait, which it, which, which like directions? Like a nightmare which stock. which direction yeah. is the, the taper? Um, so if you're the looking at the cross or... section front to back, um, the outside of the drawer is vertical. The inside is wider at the bottom, narrower at the top. So it angles toward the outside of the drawer, top to bottom. <clears throat> Some people thought, well, they're using leftover clabbers, which are already tapered. I think that's I don't think that's the case. Um, I think it's because. Having a thicker drawer side at the bottom gives you more meat for your groove and a stronger drawer, but then tapering at the top gives it a lighter look okay. at the top. Yeah, I, I'm not buying that it's to give you more room inside the drawer. You're getting because nothing. Like well, it's, a, it, the, it's minute. They were shakers, too. They, they weren't, like, collecting, you know. <laughs> They're very efficient, though. Yeah. Very efficient, sure. They're, like, measuring the, like, the... The area of the drawer. Yeah, but I don't think they were saying, like, oh, I wish I could fit another pair of pants in this drawer. That's good. But if we go five-inch drawer side to get a really heavy bottom, They weren't looking for things that spark joy. The storage area. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think the Shakers were the very first at sparking joy in their lives. I think they were all about that. Well, there was... (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I just read... (laughs) There's a certain, I don't know. There's there's a there's, there's a, a there's a joy sparker left out of their world. There's a certain <laughs> minimalist <laughs> philosophy to their lifestyle. That I'll buy. Yeah. And I just read Bexford's Shaker Legacy, which is really good. I was really bummed I waited this long. But there was a line from is it Mother Anne? Mother yeah. yeah. And it was don't waste a second of your life because you don't have a second to waste. Like, oh, that'll put a fire under your oh butt. You know, like, that's like get happy and get working or get out. Yeah. And then the the rest of that is, so just take a second and think about all the seconds <laughs> you've wasted up to this point. It's like, <laughs> see, that's depressing, too. It is, yeah. It cuts so, either way. Yeah. All right. One, two, three, break. <laughs> 2019 Fine Woodworking Live presenters, Chris Bexford. Matt Bickford, Brian Boggs, Danielle Rosebird, Michael Fortune, Peter Galbert, Chris Gochner, Garrett Hack, Nancy Hiller, Beth Ireland, Raleigh Johnson, Joshua Klein, Steve Lada, Tom McLaughlin, Mike Pekovich, Chris Schwarz, and Bob Van Dyke. I don't know what else to say. FineWoodworkingLive.com.
Question number three from Caleb. I'm wondering if any of, any of you have used a hollow chisel mortiser as a drill press. Is this a viable way to get around buying a drill press? Caleb. That could be the smartest question ever. <laughs> yeah. But. Uh, so Ben emailed me this question. He's like, take one for the team. Full stop. Like that was. The- <laughs> <laughs> Did you try it? No, because I do not want to touch that setting. And like this I is, don't this is wanna, the answer. I, I don't want to touch that setting. What, it's what the setting are we talking about? A centered quarter inch mortise, a quarter inch mortise scan, centered on one inch. Oh, because you're one still you still yeah, got so it. Still, okay, yeah. yeah. So it was that. To you've used a mortise for a whole lot more than me. Is that setting precious to you? Like, or do you not want to touch that until you need to touch it? The setting is only relevant once I get through the parts that I need it okay. for. Because I'm always doing different um, size mortises and different thicknesses, widths of stock and everything. All right, fair. Different heights, all that kind of stuff. No, I, I just assume everything's going to change. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I'm just being overly <clears throat> precious. Yeah, that's okay. Get I get it. I, I, I don't have the confidence so you- of a Pekovic, and I would leave it until I, I absolutely... Like, the same way <clears throat> I... I set scrap from a project into a special pile because I am going to screw something up and I am going to need something from that scrap that came from the same oh, board. Oh, yeah. No, I think I'm that is really important. I'm not going to change the setting on my benchtop mortiser unless I have to. Right. No, I, I think that's uh, – if I'm in the middle of a job, even if I'm technically done mortising, I'll leave everything set up, every, you know, and you'll sort of keep track of what's set up for yeah. what. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think that is really, and like scraps, really, really important. I, I don't ever, I did it by accident, not by accident, but for different reasons. Um, you know, that whole notion of if you're making a table with four legs, go ahead and make five. It's mm-hmm. like, no, you make five. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, what is really important is keeping the off cuts, you know, so you do have scrap, which is exactly the same thickness or dimension of other parts. If you're setting up for machine setups later on, or, um, <clears throat> or if you're doing finishing samples, you want to, you want to do your finish sample on a piece mm-hmm. of sock, which is exactly the same as mm-hmm. a piece of stuff. So, um, I, yeah, I keep all that stuff. I think that's really, really important. One thing though, that was a concern was the length of the auger bit protruding mm. from the chuck. That's yeah. a lot longer than out of a drill press. Yeah. You can just put a different drill bit in, though. Yeah. It's going to be really high. Just, you, yeah. 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 So, well, if I put a You would have to build dr- a deck to raise it up or something. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because I, I already had to shim up my base to be able to do a through mortise. Yeah. I'm going to say... I'm going to say definitely in a pinch, if you have to drill a hole and for some reason your drill press is broken or or somebody borrowed it, you can drill a hole with a mortiser. I don't like it as a workaround for a drill press. Also. I think you need a drill press. You need both. Drill presses can be had yeah. pretty inexpensively. Yeah. Like I had one, you know, I had a bargain tool store drill press. That was the only drill press I had in Nashville. And it was fine, mm-hmm. um, teeny tiny and fine. Um, when I got this drill press, I gave it away to somebody, and I'm sure he's using it, and it's fine for what he needs. Um, I think I maybe paid thirty five or forty dollars for it. That's the thing. Yeah, unless it's a space concern. Yeah. Drill presses are just they're cheap used. You yeah. Know? Yeah, especially older ones, because like in factories, they would have like whole lines of drill presses lined up. So that's why you can find those benchtop drill presses like the old Rockwells or um, any of the older brands. Um, because they weren't geared for woodworking per se, they're just a drill press. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of drill presses involved in manufacturing, and you can still find those old ones pretty cheap, a couple hundred bucks. Oh, sweet. All right. <clears throat> The, your take on it though was really interesting because I, I had never <clears throat> thought about the settings and not wanting to move it. Does that same mentality though exist for the drill press? No. Are you like it's more utilitarian? That's not the right word. I don't it's use more a general f- purpose. 
I don't use a fence on the drill press for precision or anything like that. I might use it for consistency and for ease, speed. Yeah, yeah. Um, you are big on setting a fence. I like fences. Yeah, yeah. For the drill press, but ninety percent of the time I'm going to the drill press. I'm just drilling a hole, and I've poked it with an awl or something. You know, it's like I've yeah. I've got one little spot to drill. You know. If if you're when you're doing your mortises for for a wall cabinet or something like that, you set up a fence and and get it all precise. But yeah, if I'm drilling out the waste, because um, I'll scribe a square, then I'll just sort of go to the drill press, and they're sort of random holes. That's kind of to your point. It's just kind of just to kind of get you close. Um, but with the drill press, because you're if you're trying to eyeball a hole, say like with like near the corner of a square. Mm-hmm. And you want to be close to the corner as you can to get rid of the waste, but you don't want to cut into it. And you're trying to sort of align in two axes, front to back and side to side at the same time. It's a little bit tough. So I'll throw a fence on there just to get my front to back close. So I'm drilling, say, within a 32nd of my edge. And then I'm only worried about side to side. So it's just to kind of help me eyeball it with a little bit more accuracy. But typically on a drill press, you're not worried about that fence setting as you would be on a mortiser. Sometimes, yes. Okay, all right. Yeah, in fact, right now I've got a whole setup of Kumiko blocks where you have to drill a hole for the hole down, sliding hole down, doing a dead center in the groove in the top of the Kumiko block. Okay. And I got a hundred to do. I'm not going to oh. mark, and I'm, you know, I've got a fence there, and I am get that set up really accurately. When I'm milling my stock, I realize that I'm using the fence for the drill press to drill these, so I mill up all my stock exactly the same thickness, and then when I run the groove at the table saw using a dado blade, I do a really, really accurate job, as accurate as I can, to center that groove in the block itself, so when I drill the centered hole, it's still in line mm-hmm. with the center of the groove. So yeah, all that works its way all the way back to the milling process. But uh-huh. that's the exception on the drill press, and the rule on a mortiser. Uh, You're always going for accuracy on a mortiser. Yeah, like my Set grooving up. plane is married to that mortise location. And so, like, I feel like I have double at stake. But it, you also hear in the Kumiko block situation because yeah. it's the planer yeah. data. St- or yeah, if, I mean, if you're making 100 of anything, it's, it's woodworking's entirely different. I'd probably say 85% of the time at the drill press, I want to hold exactly where I want it. And it's either with a center point, like you said, or it's with a fence. Okay. Right. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Question number four from Chris. This one could turn into a rabbit hole. Uh, <laughs> what books inspire you to get out in your shop and build something? Uh, and it should I should start off that this was after reading Mike's and Matt's books, and they made him want to go out into the shop and build. Oh, because, like, you cut that out of this he, question. He just edited that right out. You cut Matt's book out of the question. <laughs> <laughs> Any favorite books on the history of woodworking and maybe different trends through the ages or books specific to a style of woodworking, be it shaker or arts and crafts? And then Larry asked a question that that dovetailed well with this one. I would love to see a Shop Talk Live episode on go-to reference books for novice woodworkers. So mm. we just thought we'd have, like, a little book discussion. So cool. I have, uh, I, I have Mike's a, book, Matt's book. No, no, no. I, have a, I have a rant, but I'll save it for the end. All right. So, so that's looming. Well, I want to, the, the reference books thing. Yeah. That one was interesting because he mentioned like just cornerstone reference book, the, the Taya Frid ones. The Taya Frid. Taya. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else? Oh, the Encyclopedia of Furniture Making by Joyce. Ernest Joyce? That one I didn't know. Tess Vic loves that. That's how I found okay. that. It's yeah. that's right. It's He's expansive. So and another one that I'm not remembering. Charles Hayward. Yeah, the four Hayward awesome. books. Yeah. And if you have those books, you can probably build just about anything. You know, like you have your foundational skills. I'd also ta- toss in the ton illustrated guides, but there's like ten of those. But if you're an unlimited member, you have <laughs> access to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> this episode <laughs> brought to you by. <laughs> but. So for reference books, maybe get like furniture reference, like the Cassay book, books where there are measured illustrated drawings yeah. of whatever you're into, shaker furniture, arts and crafts, Chinese domestic furniture, that book by Eck, I think Gustav Eck, um, 
There's one I like where it's measured drawings of old, in, wait, old English oak furniture by Hurl. Daryl Hurl? It's probably not Daryl Hurl. That's unfortunate. I don't know. I can't believe you don't have it on that page of notes for you, this question. I wrote down the title, but I didn't bring the book because you said no visual aids and no Ben pictures. brought his library. Oh, this is nothing. <laughs> but so for reference books, maybe not skills and more toward projects or a mix of like projects and skills. Like, uh, yeah. Like, so I have Taya Fred's. Um, Taya Fred. <laughs> and uh, I have a few of the complete illustrated guides. And then I've gone through more of them on the, with, in the online library for unlimited mm-hmm. members. But, and like any one of those, if you had Charles Hayward, like, like you said, just one of those as a reference to how am I going to cut a bridal joint? Here's a great way of cutting a bridal joint. Gary Rogowski says in the Illustrated Guide to Joinery, boom, do that, you know? Um, but the inspiration thing, I totally agree. There's, because at some point it becomes too much, right? Like, yeah. the, how do I cut a dovetail? You, how do I cut a tenon? Too it's many like, options. Pause. You have the reference books. And if you want more reference, Get not design reference, but something with measured drawings. Like if you're into that, like get go out and I think I got these on eBay. Uh, wow, that's a weird name. Edgner Hanberg shop drawings of Shaker furniture and woodenware. I have volume two and volume three, and it tears me apart. I don't have volume one um, because I have volume one. <laughs> but, but do you have this from the series? Because I need. I need it to match. No, it's newer than that. It's yeah, got see, that little glossy <laughs> see, I, uh, cover on it. I need things to match. Yeah. They're fantastic. Um, Cassay's Shaker, mm-hmm. Illustrated Furniture, awesome. Yeah, um, I borrow mics a lot. Yeah, I think volume one is all the chairs because I think that's oh, what man. I have. Okay. So, so the answer is, for Larry, you have enough reference books. Like if you have yeah. those, I think it's you don't need more. And I hate giving that answer, but... I think for um, books on history, that's that's entire like you know, I'm not super into the history aspect of it. Like I've got Schwarz's, uh, what's the Roman, Roman workbenches? It's not. It's the one that has the Roman workbenches in it. I forget what woodworkers of Estonia. No, crap. But, like, that's interesting to see different work-holding methods that they used to use and things like Mm -hmm. that. That doesn't necessarily apply to what I'm doing in the shop now. Um, So that's – I'm not as interested in in the history as you are. Yeah, I dig it. But Mike was silent through that reference book thing, and I felt like something was stewing in there. Uh, I'm trying to save my rant for later, Uh but – We can say – all right, because I have history books. Um. Well, forget it. I'm going to, I'm just, I think, um, I work in a magazine called Fine Woodworking Magazine. Yeah. So I've been avoiding saying like we the all magazine. Do. Yeah. So, okay. Here's the thing. Um, Fine Woodworking is probably the greatest reference for woodworking. Um, in literally in the last 40 years yeah. that you will ever find. I don't think that because I work here, I work here because I, I think of that. Yeah. But, um, I mean, Fine Woodworking, it's. I know it's a magazine. It looks like a lot of other magazines. There's departments. There's articles. There's a fundamental difference um, in the approach, the scope, the aim of the magazine from its inception in that it basically was designed to be a journal of the craft. And by that, what I mean is this sort of a um, document, a recording of best practices by the best woodworkers working at the time. So... um, and I think there's a fundamental difference between the kind of art, the kind of articles that are created um, with the aim of finding the experts in the field and getting their knowledge, their um, approach to the craft, and documenting that, as opposed to, okay, here is a staff of editors who are also woodworkers, and every issue they go out to the shop and they build a piece of furniture with the aim of making and magazine article out of it, yeah, which is fine. But I think, honestly, there's there's a lack of depth, I think, um, to a piece whose sole aim is to be in the pages of a magazine. Um, whereas, like, every project in fine woodworking, it's, it's real stuff. It's made 
by professional makers and we identify pieces, we either say, that is a great piece. Can you can we do an article on how that is made? Or um, a woodworker who's worked with us for a long time will sort of say, these are the projects I have coming up. These are commissions mm-hmm. I have coming up. Do you want to document how these are made? And I think um, I think that's a strong point is that you're getting real, real stuff. You're also getting like the best, best, best information from a variety of makers. So uh, Federal Serpentine Sideboard, you're getting Steve Latta um, telling you how to do it. You're getting Michael Fortune telling you how to design and pull off um, massively brilliant contemporary furniture. You're getting Al Breed teaching you how to carve traditional carvings. I mean, um, no single resource in any book by a single author is going to have that breadth of information. Um, so really, I mean, I think that is, that is the best reference now is Fine Woodworking Unlimited, <laughs> um, the archives of Fine Woodworking Magazine. Yeah. Um, and even just the amount we invest per page in an issue is astronomical what it costs for us to have editors who actually fly or travel out to the editor shop and photograph it and take their knowledge and invest that into the information that ends up on the pages to have an art staff who are all woodworkers who are continuing to ask questions about what do you mean what's really going on here how do we convey and communicate that in a really clear way um i mean it's it's like an embarrassment of riches um when you gather all that information together in terms of, you know, the investment per page, not even getting into the quality of illustrations and the illustrators we use. Um, It's an insane reference. And that's what I really like about working here is we're not just making a magazine. You read once and you throw it away. You know, we're, we're really trying to contribute to that um, body of knowledge in terms of for anyone to approach a craft at any level. Um, and it's a lot of contradictory stuff because it's like every woodworker has a different way to go about it. Um, but that's it. That's the reference. Well, and I think that it's important that it's the best woodworkers in the world many times don't own a smartphone, let alone can produce the media without the help of like fine woodworking yeah. or someone like that. So you're getting the information from the guy who's not necessarily worried about followers and, you know, subscribers and all that stuff. They're Follower, worried about followers are, are fine. <laughs> Depress Mike day. on this well, podcast. <laughs> But it's, it's, you know, it's, this is, these are people who are making furniture. That's yeah. their primary concern. Yeah, and I don't want to disparage anybody out no. there making content because we— It's a different thing, though. We are actively going out there and finding Philip Morley's and Daniel Rosebird and anybody in Libby Shrum and anybody out there doing cool stuff. We're like, yeah, 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 this is great. You know, come on in. We want that, too. So that's—I'm I'm most excited by um, not only— the legacy that fine working is created in terms of knowledge, but also our attempts now to still go out and find really new, exciting stuff. So I love books. All right. The thing is with the magazine is you get bite-sized pieces. Whereas the book, you're going to have to wade through milling lumber and lumber selection and top tools you have for your shop before you get to the, the, the end table that you want to make or like the design thing. And which this, is great because you get a single voice and it's all there. And it's that's you, the strength of a single book. Yeah. yeah. Just like, oh, table of contents. I know that this is in this book. The magazine, though, if you want to see how to use a router table or table saw jigs, or like, I know my cross cut sled is garbage. I should go, go check out on Fine Woodworking how to build a cross cut sled. It's these bite sized chunks. Or Google. Yeah, you Google what you want and then put fine woodworking at the end. That's what I do. (laughs) But, and so for me, after a certain point, the magazine becomes incredibly more valuable than books because you have like a foundation to build upon. You know a mortise from a tenon. Now you don't have to learn everything in another book. Yeah, You can grab the articles. They're different things for me. They're like, like I don't get my history Jones from this magazine. Yeah, you know, I, I, I... Well, 40 years, it's a long time. 
But it's 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 you know sometimes I I watch YouTube videos and sometimes I want to watch a movie. I think it's a different thing. Whether like you know if I'm thumbing through Shaker drawings, it's just because it's fun. If I want to know how to cut dovetails with a table saw, I go straight to the website and pull up the article. You know, it's it's some sometimes the magazine inspires me. Sometimes books inspire me. Sometimes YouTube videos inspire me. Sometimes Instagram inspires me. Um, I don't think there's any one resource these days to get all of your information. Yeah, from. and you guys brought up the good point that the weak part of the magazine is that it's really there's so much information. It's hard to say. Well, how do I cut a dovetail? Okay, here's 37 ways mm -hmm. to cut yeah. a dovetail. It's like, okay, which is the best way? It depends on a million other factors, whereas if you do have a book by a person, you know, I think in a lot of ways, traditionally you learned the craft from a person and you learned every method that they used and you also understood the logic between all the different ways they went about doing and how they fit together into a process. Um, so I think books do a really, really good job of giving you that singular viewpoint and kind of a, a single linear approach to making where, yeah, I mean, magazine is sort of like, wow, which, you know, where am I here? That's, that's one thing that I like about the Frid books, the three, is they yes. are a, it's one guy telling you how to do something, but it's three different ways, lots of ways. So you could cut a tenon this way all by hand or some kind of hybrid way where it's like you do the shoulder cuts on with the hands on, then you take it to the router table or all table saw. Right. And that I dig because it kind of hits what tooling do you have? How do you want to get there? Well, but that, I mean, that, that could be said for the complete illustrated guides. It could be said for the Hayward books. That could be said for many. The Hayward's all hand, isn't it? I don't think so. I thought I've, part I've, of his stick was like them. I've thumbed through them. I I, I haven't. Right. I don't own them. But it's it's dangerous though to. I don't know. I've got a fairly sizable library of woodworking books, and I've got unfettered access to everything we've ever done. I literally sat down to cut dovetails the other day by hand and forgot. Do I have a table saw blade in my hand? <laughs> I, I will know. It was, it was, I right, it's... like, because in the time that I have since cut dovetails, mm -hmm. I've filmed Gochner do it, Bexford do it, Pekovich do it. Yeah. And they all became flubble doubled yes. in my head. <clears throat> and it makes me want to open up page 32 of the How and Why of Woodworking. And I always just say that backwards and follow that resource, you know? All right, so then what books make you want to get in the shop? So the magazine's wonderful. Like, yeah. I, and yeah. that's it. Um, like Cranoff Cabinet Maker's Notebook uh -huh. is great. There's a Dover Press uh, reproduction of drawings of stickly furniture from Craftsman Magazine. Really? So all these kind of these ink drawings with a really crude scale at the bottom of the page. Really, really cool stuff. Um, the Casse book uh, with the Book of Shaker Furniture. Yeah. Beautifully uh, rendered book of illustrations. Um, actually, for an arts and crafts book, there's a book called In the Arts and Crafts Style, which is nothing more than a bunch of pages of interiors in which there's arts and crafts furniture in it. Mm -hmm. And like some of them, it's a really contemporary space with a few antiques. Some of it is sort of different takes on arts and crafts furniture. Some of them are these hodgepodges of different styles all kind of blended together and for me it was tremendously eye-opening because as furniture makers we tend to think of a single piece of furniture sort of in a vacuum um, but it really opened my eyes how a piece can interact with a space and with other pieces that might not be quote-unquote of the same style so it's not like a jc penny showroom of stickly inspired furniture and it all looks the same and you have those stupid little square spindles and the fake through tendons and all that kind of stuff it's like oh you can build a piece with character and it can fit with other things which don't necessarily go with it, but they also have a sense of character and you're mm -hmm. creating more of this kind of space. So that book was really inspiring for me. But again, we're talking about reference books and I think that's our answer. Well, okay. Random reference books. Uh, I mean, the, the Krenov uh. cabinet maker's notebook was his philosophy, his approach. And you, when I read that, 
it makes me want to be in the shop and it gives me a method to a way to think while I'm in there. And then his furniture was so beautiful that that in and of itself was nice. And so Mm -hmm. the whole picture was, if you approach it in this manner, you're going to end up with stuff that looks like this. So it's like, okay, I'm in. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, history books. Do any of you dig? Uh, I'm, uh, no. All right. Um, I mean, there's two different kinds. One is the history of furniture, and you have like one picture of Jacobean furniture, yeah. one picture of Queen Anne, one picture of an arts and crafts piece and a shaker piece. And it's kind of like, okay, that's kind of tough. I think it is important to, to get in your mind a timeline of furniture. I don't know if a single book can do that. Maybe it could even be a Wikipedia kind of a thing. But then the other type of history book is like a, a focus on examples of a specific period and type of furniture. I think that can be really, really useful as well. You turned me on to this. It was, is it American Furniture of the 18th Century by someone green? Jeffrey Green. Jeffrey Green. Yeah. Oh, my. I'm about to reread that. That book kills it. And I'm not super in love with 18th century furniture, but the history, he goes into methodology, styles, and it's really well written and accessible and yeah, that's, that's a killer. great book. Yep. History books. I mean, it's not it's not furniture, but the Eric Sloan stuff. Yeah, I think. I mean, it's just beautiful to look at, and interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, seeing the different tools and what they were used for, and like, I'm never going to use that tool or how it was intended to be used. But I I dig that stuff, and I think that would be a history. Yeah, inspired. That's very cool. And the Arts and Crafts book by John Benson and yep. Kevin Rodeau. Yeah. It's just a, a really brilliant well thought survey on arts and crafts furniture because it was such a broad style that really encompassed so much so many different makers and countries that things were being made that that really was a really great put it into context where everything was within that style and i think and also great photographs of really beautiful furniture that you probably haven't been familiar with before looking at the book because right. arts and crafts ain't stickly and it ain't stickly and green and green. That's like, okay, <laughs> that's those are both great, but you know, that's just the beginning to a world of really bizarre, funky, mm-hmm. interesting work. All right. I have two. Hold on. That one's a reference book. It is Ron Hawk's The Perfect Edge. Oh. It's not it tells you different ways to get sharp, uh-huh. but it explains <clears throat> sharp and a little bit a lot about metals. That's an excellent reference on sharpening because it's Leaves your options open, mm-hmm. but it tells you what sharp is, and you know it, it's fantastic. Cool. But as far as history goes, it is the Artisan of Ipswich by. I'm not going to get it. I have it in my notes, but I write really small. Oh, Terule. Robert Terule. I think he used to work at Plymouth Plantation, which mm-hmm. is where Follinsby used to work, and it's a historical fiction that's you know really research and experience based about this guy Thomas Dennis and how he made his furniture mm. and it, like the sights and sounds of the area he lived in it's tremendous mm. all right we're about to run out of card so okay uh let's see any uh, i'm going to read this one from uh a five star rating from honky tonk slim this week, there was a great conversation about favorite thicknesses. Totally agree with Mike. Three-quarter inches garbage. Yes. Three inches for life. Ride or die. <laughs> it was a conversation I wish I could have with my friends. Also, I really want to meet Ben and have him call me by my Instagram name instead of my real name. <laughs> and that happens far more often than I care to admit. Uh, all right. That's all for this episode of Shop Talk Live. If you have any questions you'd like us to answer on the show, send them into shoptalk at taunton.com. If you're watching on YouTube, please click that thumbs up button. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Thanks for listening. Nobody calls me by my Instagram handle. It's not even a good one. Oh, you're Pekovich Woodworks. It's like no one says that. You could stop. Oh, you know who I met? The punk rock shaker. Speaking of a oh, Joel. Joel. Yeah. yeah, Joel. It's like, yeah, and then Peter says, This is a punk rock shaker. It's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I love the way that. it works. Yeah. yeah. yeah.